Our next speaker is an electro engineer and will be um, actually has plenty of experience in the work of Tesla. He's vice president and editor of the Borderland Research Foundation. He has had in the past RCA support, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric support, as well as Bell Telephone support. He's also had the uh, distinguishing characteristic of a reversing the utilities power meter without the company approval and uh, <laughs> received some reaction for that. Speaking on the topic of representations of electric induction, we have Mr. Eric Dollard. Okay, there has been a slight change. Uh, representations of electric induction would have been so theoretical and nothing but blackboards full of Greek letters, which I didn't feel was really appropriate. I've changed it to the principles of wireless power, which I think will be easier for people to understand. Okay, in the period from 1890 to 1900, Dr. Nikola Tesla was engaged in the systematic research of high-frequency electric waves with the specific aim of developing a method of transmission and reception of electrical energy without the use of wires. Inspired by Dr. Heinrich Hertz's experimental researches into the Maxwell theory of electromagnetic waves, Dr. Tesla developed various apparatus for the object of exploring the developments of Dr. Hertz. Tesla found to his dismay he couldn't prove that the oscillations that Hertz was using were akin to the original theory of electromagnetism as described by Maxwell and which Hertz attempted to prove. What Tesla discovered was the oscillations from his transformers were longitudinal electric waveforms or what might be called electric rays of induction. This indicates why Tesla was extensively interested in research with X-rays, which were considered in that period of time to be a longitudinal form of radiation. The theory of electric waves wasn't of much concern to Marconi, however, and he developed a practical system which was put into commercial use by 1919, constructed five high-frequency power plants around the world, which operated on 18 kilocycles per second at 200 kilowatts of drive to the antenna. This was done by motor generator sets known as the Alexanders and Alternators and was fed to a multiple loaded antenna system which I have shown in the figure here. Okay, what Marconi had is he had a giant mesh of copper suspended 300 feet in the air. It was roughly 1,000 feet long by 500 feet wide. He had a similar mesh of wires buried in the ground underneath the antenna to form a giant capacitor plate. And then at the particular installation I was associated with, there was a large bronze plate buried in the Pacific Ocean right next to where the San Andreas Fault comes in. This is in Bolinas, California. Okay, you had a 200 kilowatt alternator here. The motor generator set had an efficiency of about 20%, so it drew about a megawatt off the utility company's power line. It was fed with a 66,000 volt, 60 cycle power line. Okay, through his resonant transformer, he developed about 100 kilovolts across this large capacitor plate and in order to prevent the formation of ridiculous quantities of current that would just fuse the wires, he had to put these loading coils in here to tune with the capacitance to neutralize these currents out. It's what electrical engineering referred to as power factor correction. Well, in this case, it's the opposite of what you normally encounter. Now we're not using coils, we're using capacitors. Okay, in the schematic representation, we have two waves that propagate off of this. We have a magnetic wave that propagates through the Earth, and we have a dielectric wave that propagates through the atmosphere and then the electric wave, which is the combination of the dielectric and magnetic, is the actual transmission wave on the so-called antenna structure. Now you find that the wave propagations of these waves are quite unlike electromagnetic waves because they're, in essence they're not even electric waves. You have a dielectric wave and a magnetic wave and these basically phase and form a kind of nodal system around the planet where you'll end up with appearances of electrical energy that can be captured by a similar antenna. Okay, upon completion of these wireless plants, the United States government formed Radio Corporation of America to take control of these installations. This was in 1919. As soon as Marconi finished them, he lost them. The RCA was very quick to develop upon the transverse form of electromagnetic wave propagation, and they developed what was referred to as the Type D director, which now is known amongst most radio engineers as the rhombic antenna. Okay, it's basically you have utility poles usually between 100 and, or stacked utility poles from 150 to 200 feet in height holding a large diamond-shaped coil of wire in the air. You have a resistance at the end and a high-frequency transmitter and the input and waves are launched on this transmission structure and in their propagation to the resistor are lost by energy leakages which are called electromagnetic radiation. Okay, we have the inductance of the antenna here. The antenna 
area represented by you know conventional coils and the capacitance in this area between the surfaces of the conductors is represented by capacitance. Now our actual transmission is done by the conductance that appears due to the dielectric hysteresis of this capacitance in this wide open space. And we have a resistance that appears in the magnetic hysteresis in the inductant, magnetic inductance of this wide open space. So the energy basically disappears into the hysteresis of the ether and very little is reflected back and it's a highly inefficient system of transmission but of course it's what we use today. The dipole antenna basically is just a shortened version of this that has to be tuned for a particular resonant frequency but this will operate on all frequencies. Okay, the development of, of this antenna and the use of these Hertzian waves diverted much interest from Nikola Tesla's work and delayed the um, here. Delayed the Tesla world system from coming into being because this was much simpler and practical, both the Marconi and RCA systems, rather than having large high voltage towers and electrostatic generators. To quote uh, Tesla's thoughts on the development of wireless in this point in history, quote, the commercial application of the art has led to the construction of larger transmitters and multiplication of their number. Greater distances had to be covered and it became imperative to employ receiving devices of ever greater sensitiveness. All these changes have cooperated in emphasizing the trouble and seriously impairing the reliability and value of these plants. To such a degree has this been the case that conservative businessmen and financiers have come to look upon this method of conveying intelligence as one of offering but very limited possibilities. And the government has deemed it necessary to assume control. This unfortunate state of affairs, fatal to the enlistment of capital and healthful competitive development, could have been avoided had electricians not remained to this day under a delusive theory, speaking of the Hertzian theory, and had practical exploiters of this advance not permitted enterprise to outrun technical competence. Okay, Dr. Tesla himself remained totally unswayed by these developments and fully understood that the Hertzian waves were useless because of their scattering nature. And to quote again, nothing illustrates this better than the recent demonstrations of a number of experts with very short waves, which have created the impression that power will eventually be transmitted by such means. In reality, experiments of this kind are the very denial of the possibility of energy transmission. And this, of course, brings to mind the recent proposal to send so photovoltaic generated power via mi mi microwave beams and satellites down to the Earth. Okay, the Tesla system of transmission and reception of electric energy without the employment of connecting wires or waveguides as conceived by Dr. Tesla is not the propagation of any type of electromagnetic wave. The word electromagnetism has no relation to any of Tesla's work, nor is it the excitation of the Earth ionosphere waveguide as is often proposed. The Tesla system employs resonant actions along lines or rays of electric induction, these lines standing between the transmitter and the receiver. So you have your Tesla magnifying transmitter here, or more appropriately, your Tesla transponder, and your Tesla trans receiving Tesla transponder here, so the generator is directly connected to the load via these lines of induction. Okay, the apparatus for establishing these lines of inductions, of course, has taken on the name Tesla magnifying transmitter. By definition, the TMT is a system of resonant transformers harmonically balanced to the electric condition of the Earth. Also, the monopolar nature of the TMT greatly facilitates the departure of energy from the apparatus and into the environment. When you experiment with a resonating coil, you find that all your magnetism appears at one end and all your dielectricity appears at the other end. And you have, it's interesting, even electrical discharges which occur off of the end of this will curve back and come to the point where they started from. And you can hook a, uh, a radio frequency watt meter or amp meter or whatever you want here and there'll be actual indication of very heavy flows of energy, all of which are reflected back to the coil, except that utilized by the load. Okay, to, to, these lines of induction established by the TMT are drawn into the high inductivity of the Earth's interior, which can be viewed as a very, you know, high capacity capacitor, especially considering the theory that the Earth is basically hot glass inside the mantle. Okay, to illustrate exactly how Tesla felt this propagation would occur in the Earth. He has an experiment that he gives here. 
Okay, the quote. I here have a short, wide tube which is exhausted to a high degree, which back then was just about, you know, the exhaustion you would find in a regular street lamp. In other words, there's still gas in the bulb. Okay, and covered with a substantial coating of bronze. He plated bronze onto the surface of the bulb to give it a metal shell around the outside to allegedly shield it. The coating barely allowing the light to shine through. A metallic clasp with a hook for suspending this tube is fastened around the middle portion of the ladder, the clasp being in contact with the bronze coating. I now want to light the gas inside by suspending the tube on a connecting wire to a coil. Anyone who would try this experiment for the first time, not having any previous experience, would probably take care to be quite alone when making this trial for fear that he might not become the joke of his assistants. Still, the bulb lights in spite of the metal coating, and the light can be distinctly perceived through the ladder. Okay, and he has another experiment, a long tube covered with aluminum.